One thing I find really interesting these days about consumer sentiment as well as the current state of the housing market is just how much most people are obsessed with home ownership and how much uh, people just will do anything to get a house. And we saw that during the FOMO days when people were just piling into the market and you know paying over asking price for homes and in some case people still are you know waiving inspections all these things that people did and the thing that i think that's interesting about it right now is this on average at the moment buying a house will cost you about one thousand and thirty dollars more per month than the average rental across the country guys now that's an extra 12 grand a year and counting depending on which area you're looking at and yet people are still obsessed with being able to get a house this is obviously due to mortgage rates practically doubling in the span of a year as well as home prices going up about 40 percent over the past three years but the thing that i find fascinating about this is even though buying is that much more expensive you still have a bunch of people who would rather buy than rent and this is a mentality that i just can't understand i can't really wrap my head around it and the reason is because obviously for a long time just like many of us were at one point i was a renter right i was a renter all of my life until 2022 when i bought my place that i live in now now I owned real estate prior to that, but I bought investment real estate. And how was I able to buy, buy investment real estate was actually because my rent was so low, guys. I paid very low rent for so many years, and I loved having that low rent payment. And I always used to check in whenever the lease was up to see, hey, would it make sense to buy anything right now? Can we find anything comparable to where we live and buy that for roughly the same price we're paying in rent? And every year consecutively the answer was no you just couldn't you know renting was just far cheaper here in miami than buying was and then right around the end of 2021 or so that completely got flipped on its head to the point where buying was equal to if not cheaper than renting because i had my rental that i was paying like 2200 dollars a month and then practically overnight it seemed that rentals within the building that I'm in that were similar, we're starting to rent for 4,000 a month and up, guys. So you're looking at your rent practically doubling if you were to move or renew the lease. And that didn't make any sense to me because that was pretty much equal to the cost to own. And the thing is, renting really wasn't all that bad. You know, I was pretty happy being a renter and I would probably still be renting if the rent prices were significantly lower than buying here in Miami. There was really no motivation to buy a place, especially saving all this money every month and being able to invest in real estate with that savings was a nice, uh, advantage to renting for me at least it always was and that's what brings me back to my original point here like where is this coming from that all of a sudden people feel like you know they're willing to pay a thousand dollars more per month to own something than to rent guys I mean it just sounds insane to me that's an extra twelve thousand dollars a year that you just can't get back unless you sell the property obviously and then between all the upkeep costs property taxes and insurance that you pour into it over the years how much are you really getting back when you do sell even for a profit you know what i'm saying i'm definitely not uh, knocking home ownership or saying that it's not good to be a property owner obviously there are advantages to having your own place you know you can do whatever you want with the place without the landlord's approval you know you don't have to move that was one of the big motivations for me besides the price being practically equal and it's not like owning is a bad thing but i just want to understand the obsession with it so if you're one of these people that would actually still go out and buy right now even if the cost to own is a thousand dollars a month more than renting let me know and let me know what your motivations or reasonings for this are down in the comments so that way i can kind of wrap my head around what people are thinking right now and what's driving people to purchase even in an insane market like this where inventory is extremely low 
and interest rates are high and prices are still pretty high. I mean, before I got it, I understood why people would buy because when you go back to 2021, guys, it was more expensive to rent than to own in 60% of the US, uh, according to the data firm Adam. So home ownership and buying a house was a no brainer back then. Also interest rates and prices were far lower than they are today, which made it seem like, yeah, if I need a place to live, why not just buy something? Why am I gonna pay some guy rent, you know, when I can own my own house for even less? And that was always the case too in the Midwest where I grew up, like to rent a house over there, costs pretty much the same, if not more, than just owning your own house because the real estate is so cheap there. Then it just comes down to a lifestyle choice of needing the flexibility to move when you need to move or wanting to try out new neighborhoods or simply just not having the qualifications or the money to buy. Because the other thing is this, most people, when they go to the grocery store, for example, they wanna find the best deals, right? People wanna buy the food that they wanna get and get the best deal on it. Same thing when you're shopping for like a new TV or a new car, people wanna get the best deal, right? But it seems like that kind of mentality just goes out the window when it comes to home ownership because it's crystal clear right now that renting is a lot cheaper than owning, yet you still have so many people clamoring to buy. And the other thing that's interesting about this is so many people want prices to go lower, right? So many people want housing to be more affordable but yet you have sellers that don't want to list their homes for sale a lot of people who own the house now that bought a few years ago probably couldn't even afford to buy their same house over again the difference between what people say and what they do is huge right now because people say they want more affordable housing and they want real estate to be cheaper right so you can get in and buy a house without getting gouged but at the same time people rush out there and compete to buy these overpriced listings and everybody wonders why home prices aren't coming down. It's because of behavior like that, guys. It's because of people doing anything, you know, desperately to get a house that they probably aren't even, not even gonna be happy with or they probably don't even really want. It's not the most desirable option. It's just what's available at the moment. So the more people do that, the longer and more expensive housing will continue to be. Simple as that, because it is a supply and demand game. So when you have the people that are in charge of demand, you know, out there bidding up the little bit of supply that we have, it's gonna keep prices high. And it's, like I said before, to me, this is the only reason prices haven't completely collapsed yet, because it looks like demand is high only because inventory is so low. But when you look at mortgage applications, it shows the real picture, guys. Like if we were at uh, pre-pandemic inventory levels right now, if we had one and a half, two million houses for sale in the United States, you know, the housing market would be in a full free fall at the moment because there would not be enough buyers out there to buy these properties. And when something is in short supply, like the amount of available listings right now, it allows sellers to charge a premium because that's what's available. It's a take it or leave it type of deal. So the sellers hold all the cards in those situations where you live in an area where there's no inventory. In fact, right at this moment, there are 38% fewer homes for sale on the US housing market than there were in 2018. So that is a massive reduction in available units for sale. So if people want things to come back to normal, we need more listings. So we need more people out there listing their homes for sale. And I can understand from a seller's perspective why they wouldn't want to do this. Wow, I was just saying yesterday in my video how these rising costs of ownership for these homes when it comes to homeowners insurance as well as the property taxes could be starting to push people out of their homes. And this house is the perfect example of that right now. They bought this house back in 1995 for only $240,000 Fast forward to today, the house is for sale for 
3,150,000 and while it may seem like the owner is is going to make a killing and they are when they sell they're in trouble guys they are not paying their property taxes in fact for 2021 and 2022 this property is reported delinquent on their property taxes and that's about 20 grand a year so they're about forty thousand dollars behind in property taxes right now and Think about this. When they bought this house back in 1995 for only 240 grand, their property tax bill was probably a thousand, two thousand dollars a year. And now this person is facing a twenty thousand dollar a year property tax bill. And mind you, that is with a homestead exemption. So this person is literally being forced out of their house to sell because they can't afford the property taxes. But one thing I don't think most sellers understand is by hanging on to the property right now because interest rates are still high and it's still expensive to buy something else, most sellers are waiting for interest rates to come back down. Well, think about how that's gonna work, guys. If most sellers are waiting to list until interest rates say dip below 5%, which probably isn't gonna happen for maybe even another year from now. So let's say the next spring housing market in 2024 is the time when interest rates are lower finally and more home sellers decide to list because rates are lower now, right? Okay, what's gonna happen, guys? You know, buyers have been on the sidelines too, waiting for interest rates to come down. So you're likely to see buyer demand go back up as well. Really, the situation doesn't end up being that much different other than having more inventory to choose from but if everybody's still out there bidding it up and we're back to bidding wars and waiving contingencies, how is that a better market? Now, one concern with this frozen housing market that we're in right now, because buying and selling activity is so low right now, is that we're finally starting to see rent prices come down, but people are concerned that this is going to push rent prices back up because with housing affordability being pretty much at all time lows and people just not being able to buy at these prices for the most part, that forces more people into being renters, whether they want to be or not. And people are afraid that that's gonna cause rental prices to start going back up because rental demand will remain higher than for sale demand. That is a possibility. I don't see that being very likely because the rental market has a huge advantage over the for sale market right now. And that is that there's literally roughly 1 million new rental listings being added to the US rental market this year in 2023, guys. That's huge. Imagine what would happen if we saw a million extra listings hit the market for sale in the housing market. That'd be a game changer, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. So just like it would be for the for sale market, it's a game changer for the rental market as well. And speaking of being a game changer for the rental market, here's something that just happened that could be a game changer for both the for sale and the rental market. And this story was sent to me by William, so thanks for sending this to me. And what happened is the Dallas City Council in Dallas, Texas, they just banned short-term rentals from single-family home neighborhoods. Now, this is something that we're starting to see more and more cities uh, consider doing because so many people have bought properties and converted them into short-term rentals that is helping reduce the housing supply. And basically this ban is in place from all neighborhoods where there's single family homes. So like where I'm walking through right now, you would not be able to have a short-term rental here anymore. But they will still allow short-term rentals in neighborhoods that have uh, both single family homes and multifamily dwellings and in commercial areas. And the short term rentals that are left that are still going to be able to operate in these neighborhoods that still have commercial and multifamily in them, they're going to have to register with the city every single year and pay the same kind of taxes and fees as hotels pay to operate, which I think is fair, guys. I mean, if you're operating a hotel just because it's a house, but it's operating as a hotel, that doesn't give you the right to you know, skirt the rules of operating like a hotel, right? Because it is a liability. You know, you're having a lot of people coming in and out. It changes the neighborhood, that's for sure. Just like if you start a business, you have to follow the rules of starting that business, right? You have to follow the rules that come along with opening up an LLC and performing the correct payroll functions and filing tax returns for the LLC. You don't just get to operate 
like an individual anymore, right? So it makes sense that this is the case. Now the city of Dallas still will allow short-term rentals to operate in multifamily uh, residential areas where they have 20 or more units, but no more than 3% of the units will be allowed to be short-term rentals. So you're talking only six out of the 20 will allow to be short-term rentals. The rest have to be all long-term leases. So this is basically the compromise to still not completely shut down the short-term rental business, but more or less even the playing field with your neighbors because a lot of people are tired of this. They're also gonna have rules like occupancy limits and uh, quiet time hours, things like that, that they're gonna have to follow as well. Now these new rules that they're implementing in Dallas do not kick in until December in order to give current short-term rental operators time to figure out what they're gonna do with their property, as well as giving the city time uh, to figure out how they're going to enforce this. And here's the thing, guys, they are not gonna be exempting anyone from this. So if you are in a neighborhood like this and you have a single family home that is a short-term rental, you're not gonna be exempt. There's no being grandfathered in with this, only if you're in the commercial area or multifamily area, that's it. But if, you live in, if you're in an area like this, you're done. No more short-term rental for you. And of course, the people that own these houses are saying, well, you guys shutting this down is gonna lead to financial hardship for us because this is how we make our money. <laughs> now, it's pretty hard to have sympathy for people like this, guys, only because you know regular people can't even afford to get a house right now, and this is part of the problem. And let's face it, these houses were never built to become short-term rentals, okay? They were, they were always intended for people to live in them and for communities to be formed. It was never intended to be an, a hotel business. You know, they have commercial districts for that and that's why they build hotels. And right now there's about 1,000 registered short-term rentals in the city of Dallas, but that's just the registered one, so who knows how many are unregistered. So that's something that their code enforcement is gonna have to figure out when they're ready to start doing that at the end of the year. But going back to what I was saying, this is just one example, guys. So let's say 70% of those short-term rentals are no longer allowed to operate. That's 700 new listings for the Dallas area whether they will be new rentals or new homes for sale because they need to sell now, whichever the owner decides to do. But either way, it's good for the housing market. And you're starting to see more and more cities across the country crack down on this for a couple of different reasons. You know, you have neighbors complaining that having all these short-term rentals in the area, you know, causes too many problems, like crime starts to go up, you know, the noise complaints start to go up and just generally deteriorates the quality of the neighborhood. But beyond that, you have the affordable housing argument as well that this is destroying the neighborhood in terms of people can't afford to live here because investors are buying up all these properties for short-term rentals. This is definitely a department where, you know, capitalism starts clashing with uh, morality, right? Because on the one hand, a capitalist society would say, you know, it's the way business goes. It's the law of supply and demand. You want more supply? Build more housing, right? But then of course the moral side of the argument is, well, we can't just build the housing that easily, so we need to do something else. So we're going to eliminate the short-term rentals. I don't know. What do you guys think is the right thing to do? I think it's just another one of those situations where it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. There's always gonna be people who oppose rules like this, saying that it's unconstitutional and violates property rights. And you're gonna have people on the other side of the argument saying that, uh, you know, I don't wanna live in a neighborhood where this is going on. You know, I didn't sign up for this. And uh, I have a say so in what happens in my neighborhood too. So we'll see. But the point is that this type of thing could be yet another catalyst that could lead to more rental and or uh, for sale listings in the future as more cities start cracking down on these short-term rentals. Now these folks here actually got hit with a blessing in disguise because they bought back in 2005 for only $84,000 and they tried selling this house in 2016 for 1.6 million, took it off the market, then fast forward to the end of last year, they listed for 2.7, dropped it to 2.3, and now it's under contract and they're gonna be selling this house. So these guys are gonna be making far more than if they would have sold it in 2016. Property tax bill currently is $11,000 a year and they are not delinquent.
Now we know how much people are debt hounds here in the United States, right? Well, it turns out in Canada, it's even worse, which I didn't even know this, but it's pretty bad. In fact, households in Canada are starting to crack under these high interest rates because they just carry so much debt. In fact, in the first quarter of 2023, the average Canadian household has $1.85 in debt for every dollar of disposable income. So people have roughly twice the amount of debt than actual extra money that they have to spend. Let that one sink in for a moment. You already have a large amount of people over there who are starting to fall behind on their credit card payments and their car payments. And it's so bad that the delinquency rates on these loans are now higher than they were pre-pandemic, guys. That's pretty bad. And the only thing that's not worse than pre-pandemic over there at the moment is mortgage defaults. But the thing is, that data lags and will be one of the last things to show up in the data. Because if you take a look at this chart right here, it shows you just how much credit card and auto loan delinquencies are on the rise, but mortgage delinquency hasn't really ticked up yet. Now there's a couple reasons for this. Number one is that lenders in Canada have gone through uh, extreme lengths right now to pretty much protect borrowers from the pain of higher interest rates. And they've done things like allowing homeowners to add unpaid interest to a loan's principal or stop paying down the principal altogether and now you're just paying the interest on the loan. Crazy shenanigans like that kicking the can down the road similar to what we do here in the U.S. to prevent the all-out economic disaster, right? But all these things do, like we talked about in our moral hazard video, is it just kicks the problem down the road, right? It's not a problem today now, now it might be a problem in three to five years from now, and we'll deal with it then, right? But the other reason I think people aren't defaulting on the mortgages as much is because, let's face it guys, if you're looking at three bills on the table, your mortgage, your car payment, or your credit card bill, I mean, I personally would much rather pay that mortgage because you need a place to live more than you have to worry about filing bankruptcy because of credit card debt or potentially losing your car, you know? I'd rather be losing my car than losing a place to live. So I think there's that aspect to it as well, combined with the fact that people have to save a lot of money for down payments to buy real estate, you know? Even if you put a low down payment in Canada, real estate's extremely expensive. So a low down payment there it's probably like 50 to 100 grand. So people don't want to lose that down payment. You know what I'm saying? Even when you buy a car, it's far less. And when you charge money on the credit card, you got nothing invested in that. So it's pretty easy to default on those things compared to the house. But it's literally the last domino to fall. And it'll be interesting to see if it starts rising above pre-pandemic defaults when it comes to mortgages over there as things continue to get worse. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't wanna wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you in the next one.